Ben and Me, Chapter 13, The Battle of Versailles. July 4th arrived and found my preparations complete. Red Jefferson came to report late in the morning. His disheveled fur and red-rimmed eyes indicated sleepless nights of effort, but he was, as always, brimful of energy and enthusiasm. All is in readiness, Amos, he said. The sewers are in turmoil. Revolution and liberty filled the air. Vengeance is on every tongue. I can scarce restrain their ardor. See that you do, I said. One false move would ruin everything. Remember now, the third south window of the throne room. Here is your map of the palace grounds. The night will be warm and all windows open. The signal is up and at them. And not a move or sound before that signal. I am depending on you. Red glanced grimly at the cudgel, cudgel with which he had armed himself. I had a winter at Valley Forge under Von Steuben, he said. I know something of discipline. Trust me, Amos. Liberty and justice forever. He was off again, and I thanked the providence that he had sent me that this dynamic lieutenant. Lieutenant. In the afternoon, I visited Sophia for last-minute instructions. Although trembling slightly with excitement, she retained the poise of her true aristocrat. The Russians and Swedes will report to you, I told her. They are the most dependable. I myself shall take charge of the passy peasants who require a firm hand. How about the headdress? A splendid one for our purpose, Monsieur Amos, she said. Would you care to see it? Peering through a curtain, we could see three hairdressers and two maids arranging Madame, Madame's brilliance headdress for the ball. I had seen many elaborate hair arrangements at the court, but this far exceeded anything I had ever beheld. The powdered curls rising to the height of four feet above her head, we arranged to represent the waves of the ocean. Surmounting these was a full rig rigged ship with an American flag at the masthead. Long red, white, and blue ribbons inscribed liberty and justice flew from the bow spirit. Just below the ship was a colored wax medallion of Ben, upheld by pink cupids and decorated with some silly sentiment. Perfect, I said. The ship will hold all the Swedes. They are great sailors, sailors and will feel at home there. The Russians you will have to take inside, unfortunately. They are a bit uncouth. This is not a moment to worry about daint daintiness, she replied calmly. Page 93. You are splendid, madame, I exclaimed. Courage now and trust in Amos. Remember the signal. Up and at him. Not a sound or a movement before that. Fear not all will be well. Bless you, monsieur, she said bravely. Liberty and justice. The peasant mice reported to me early in the evening. They were rather a motley crew armed with scythes, clubs, and other crude weapons. I had drilled them as well as possible, but had no great confidence in their steadiness. I did try to impress on them the need for the absolute obedience and silence. Ben, of course, was in a twitter of excitement over his new clothes. This was fortunate, for I was able to stow away all my awkward band aboard with him without attracting his attention. As a matter of fact, in his state of excitement, a swarm of bees could have traveled in his cap and he would have never have noticed. Twelve of us occupied the fur cap. I began stationing at the peephole in front. The rest I secret secreted in various pockets. One clever little fellow clung to Ben's watch fob where he gave the appearance of being a charm or ornament of some sort. Top of page 94. Once we were safely started for the ball, I gave a sigh of relief. All seemed to be going well. True, there was no word from the ship rats of John Paul Jones, but I had done all I could. We must do our best without them. The Palace of Versailles was a scene of the greatest gaiety. Lights were everywhere. Fireworks filled the sky. Orchestras played. The great halls were crowded with guests, all come to honor the United States and Ben. The lights of opulent costumes, the sounds and splendors of the court, brought a great chattering from my country-bred cohort, which I sternly suppressed. We paused briefly at the entrance to the throne room while a path was cleared for Ben, and I had a moment to glance around. Among the throng I had spied, Madame Br Brion, from the sight quivering from her tower, towering headdress, I knew that Sophia's contingent was present. A glimpse of Red's flaming head on the third south window sill reassured me that he and his mob were faithful. 
Ben, of course, was the center of all attention. Every eye was upon him as we advanced slowly up the length of the great hall. As we approached the magnificent throne where the king and queen sat, I nudged the leader of my peasants. Ready? I muttered. I could feel Ben trembling with excitement as he halted to make his bow. At that tense moment, I leaned up from the people and shouted in my loudest tones the agreed signal. Up and at him! Ben fairly dripped mice. My peasant regiment swarmed from his coat, his hat, his waistcoat, waistcoat, forming in company front. At his feet, I had trained them. They charged towards the queen's throne. A scene of the wildest confusion followed. The queen and 27 of her courtiers promptly fainted. The king, pale and trembling, rose from his throne and rushed toward the window, only to be met by Red in his shrieking rabble of slum mice and sewer rats. Thereupon the king also fainted and was rather badly trampled by the fleeing ladies of the court. The white mice of the palace guard, although taken by surprise, soon rallied, driving back the first charge of my undisciplined peasants. But now the Swedes and Russians joined the fray and the battle raged fiercely about the ankles of the queen. Alas, the Reds' faith in the proletariat. At the first sight of the lavish refreshments spread out from the adjoining adjoining rooms, his freckle his fickle revolutionists dropped their weapons and rushed for the food. Screaming with rage and disappointment, Red dashed into a fray. His flashing cudgel and flaming fur were always in the thickest of the fighting. One by one, the peasants of Passy deserted and joined the demol in demolishing the refreshments. The Swedes and Russians, led by the interpreted Red, battled dog doggedly, but the tide was turning against them. From every corridor of the palace came swarms of white mice to reinforce the ranks of the enemy. Inch by inch, we were being forced back from our goal, the cell where Sophia's children lay. Amid the confusion of the conflict, I suddenly aware of the clear, thin piping sound. Could it be? Yes, surely it was. Through the hot summer air came the shrill scream of the fife, and the tune was Yankee Doodle. Through the window, they came piling the sailor rats of John Paul Jones. Fifty fighting Yankees. Lafayette, we are here. Flashing cutlasses and flailing handspikes drove through the throng. The white mice fled like snowflakes before a wind. In no time, the cage was captured, the door demolished, and Sophia's children brought forth free mice. A grizzled old bosun pulled his forelock. Captain Jones compliments, he said. Any further orders? Red appeared, dripping sweat and blood, eyes flashing. Orders, he shouted. Orders, yes, by heaven, he pointed to the refreshment room. That rabble, that scum, clear him out. Aye, aye, sir, said the bosun. The cutlasses flashed, and the deserters fled, shrieking before them. It's yours, boys, said Red. Help yourselves. And then, to me, I'm done, Amos, he slumped on the floor. Madame Brion had fainted out of politeness to the queen. We rescued Sophia from the wreckage of the headdress, and it did my heart good to see her joyous reunion with the seven children. Poor Ben, looking perfectly dazed, he stood alone in the center of a large, empty space. Everyone had crowded away from him as though he were infected with the plague. The king, by now recovered, was conferring with a group of his generals, all of whom were darting angrily glances at Ben. I began to fear for his safety. With Sophia's assistance, I managed to get to the half-conscious red into the fur cap. Then Sophia and her happy brood climbed aboard. Ben, I suggested, don't you think we had best be getting home? You seem to have lost a great deal of your popularity. We left by a rear door, still shunned by all the present. We had passed the refreshment room. Sophia and the children waved happily to their rescuers, who were boisterously celebrating in the victory.